So let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and get started. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Francisco Cigarroa, uh, who I think everyone knows. Uh, uh, Dr. Cigarroa is a, a personal hero of mine, and, and I'm sure a hero of all of yours too. But uh, a little bit about Dr. Cigarroa is originally from uh, Laredo, Texas. Uh, was uh, uh, a great student in Laredo, went to uh, Yale University for undergraduate, uh, came back to Texas at UT Southwestern for medical school, then went to uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital for uh, residency training. I uh, did a fellowship in both uh, pediatric uh, surgery and transplant at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then uh, uh, joined the faculty here in 1995. Uh, Dr. Sigaroa uh, went on to become uh, the president of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio and then the uh, chancellor of the entire uh, UT system. Uh, he really has too many honors to, uh, to, to list in a brief introduction, but uh, uh, he is uh, on the uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, the Institute of Medicine, and has uh, made a real difference in the lives of, uh, of all South Texans. And it is a, a great pleasure and honor to introduce you today. He's going to talk to us today on uh, pediatric and transplant surgery. Dr. Sigaroa. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, Ronnie, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I would say that uh, the greatest honor that I have is really having the privilege of taking care of patients. And um, I may add that Dr. Raul Vela is here. And decades ago, uh, I saw one of my very first operations with him in Laredo, Texas. So Raul, thank you very much for uh, being patient and taking me through uh, watching you do a, a cholecystectomy, if I recall correctly. So what I'd like to do today is uh, convey to you a little bit about uh, the world of pediatric uh, liver transplant surgery. Uh, it's a world that really attracted me a great deal. Uh, even though I went into administration, I can never separate myself from being a transplant surgeon. And at the end of the day, it called me back. So people still ask me, um, Cisco, are you, are you okay? Are you fine? I mean, are you doing okay since you're no longer uh, in charge of the UT system? And I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Yes, I'm absolutely okay. Uh, I've never been happier in my life. And the reason for this is, again, uh, the privilege of taking care of patients. This is uh, Catherine Valdez. And Little Catherine presented to me at the age of three. And uh, at the age of three, she was suffering from uh, cystic fibrosis, but kind of a form of cystic fibrosis that predominantly affected her liver. And so Glenn Half and I uh, did a liver transplant at, you know, on her at three years of age. And then the, within the first three months of me coming back uh, as a full-time transplant surgeon after chancellorship, uh, Catherine called me and said, you know, uh, I need a kidney transplant, and I have a living donor. Uh, would you be able to do the kidney transplant? And right then and there, I said, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And so this is about five days after her kidney transplant, and I'm proud to say that she's doing exceedingly well uh, in South Texas and, and being a very productive uh, individual uh, working in the lower Rio Grande Valley. So what I'd like to do today is... Uh, Hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you'll learn about the indications as well as the medical concepts uh, which currently shape the care of pediatric liver transplant patients. Uh, really, uh, to learn a little bit about the listing process and current clinical practices in pediatric liver transplants, and also to learn a little bit about post-transplant care. So one really can't talk about liver transplants without actually uh, saluting Tom Starzl. So, um, Tom Stars are really educated uh, the majority of leaders in transplantation surgery uh, who are basically educating the next generation of transplant surgeons. And in fact, 
uh, Glenn Half uh, studied under Tom Starzl for two years, and because of that uh, relationship, uh, you know, Glenn has been able to really establish one of the busiest and um, you know transplant programs with superb outcomes. Um, Tom Starzl actually was the individual who performed the very first uh, liver transplant on a child. And that liver transplant was on a little baby uh, who was suffering from biliary atresia. And that little baby's name was Benny Solis, uh, a son of a migrant farm worker in Colorado. So Benny Solis was three years of age. Uh, basically, Tom Starzl and his team uh, basically did all the laboratory work, uh, did a lot of surgeries on canines, and they were finally prepared to do this transplant. Unfortunately, uh, much to their dismay, uh, little Benny died in the operating room table, not because they didn't know how to do the operation. They just had no idea uh, of the degree of portal hypertension uh, that they were going to face. And so Benny Solis ended up exsanguinating on the OR table. And it was a very you know, depressing environment for Tom Starzl and his team. If you read the book, The Puzzle People, you can get a sense of just the deflation uh, that the team met. Well, subsequent to Benny Solis, uh, Tom Stars and his team persevered uh, and actually began successfully doing the operation. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Tom Starzl, Norm Shumway, Dick Lillehei, uh, Roy Colney, all of these champions involved in liver transplantation became prisoners in, in the sense of the fact that they were getting severe criticism because the outcomes were still terrible, not because they couldn't do the operation, but because the immune suppression involved in caring for these patients was totally inadequate. Uh, the mortality for these patients uh, was probably uh, 60 to 70 percent, and despite, you know, no longer having liver failure, their quality of life was terrible because of post-transplant Im you know, immune infections uh, and, and a bunch of a variety of other problems related to chronic rejection. So in fact, there was a moratorium on liver transplants for several years until cyclosporin was actually discovered. So the individual who is often kind of a quiet hero and, and really isn't spoken about in, in a great amount is actually Jean Borel. So Jean Borel uh, was a scientist working for Sandoz Laboratories in Sweden. And in fact, uh, he had a friend who went hiking in Norway and collected some soil samples of which a fungus, Talopocladium inflatum, was isolated. And Sanders was at that time really interested in antibiotics and antifungals and so forth. But John Burrell realized that cyclosporin, although it was not a great antibiotic, had some significant immunosuppressant properties. Immunosuppressant properties that in fact differentially affected the T cells compared to the overall immune system. And unlike Imuran and um, Imuran and anti-lymphocyte globulin and high dose steroids, this was a much more specific immune suppressant. And in fact became approved to be utilized for patients. And in 19 83 was approved by the FDA, and suddenly kidney transplants now had about an 80% one-year survival, and liver transplants were about 75 to 80%. And so for the very first time, liver transplantation became the operation or the procedure of choice for patients suffering from end-stage liver disease. And so the whole landscape of transplantation changed because of Jean Burrell. So. I salute Jean Burrell just as much as I salute uh, Tom Starzl. So when one starts focusing on uh, children and infants with liver failure, I think it can be categorized into maybe five broad categories, six. Uh, the most common disease that we see as pediatric transplant surgeons are those children who, are, who develop biliary atresia, and unfortunately, <coughs> despite their Kasai procedures, end up proceeding with cirrhosis who need liver transplants. So 40% of all patients that we care for often undergo transplantation because of biliary atresia. Uh, the next most common disorder that we see are patients with metabolic disorders. 
And so many of these patients have urea cycle disorders. And so for the medical students who think that you'll never see the Krebs cycle again, I promise you that if you do pediatric transplant surgery, you'll be reflecting upon the Krebs cycle once again. Uh, fulminant liver failure occurs in about 13 or 14 percent of our patients. Uh, sclerosing cholangitis, autoimmune hepatitis, and primary hepatic malignancies are also disease processes uh, that we see. So sometimes, apart from biliary atresia, which, as I stated, is a cholestatic disorder because of the obliteration of the bile ducts, some cholestatic diseases are difficult to actually diagnose in these little babies. Unfortunately, now there's you know, genetic analysis through different chips, and one can actually correlate different mutations to different diseases. So a Serpina-1 mutation is associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Allogeal syndrome is often uh, associated with JAG1 mutation, and primary familial infrahepatic cholestatic diseases are also associated with certain mutations that one can actually now uh, really analyze through a variety of laboratory tests. So um, when I started uh, doing pediatric liver transplants in the early 1990s, uh, the one-year survival rate for these little children was about 75 to 80 percent. Now, uh, children have about a 90 percent one-year survival. And I would say that uh, improvements in immune suppression, especially the evolution of Prograf, uh, which is similar to cyclosporin, but a bit better steady state uh, and easier for the children to take, has definitely diminished rejection. Um, I think a huge advance uh, was really the development of technical variant allografts, which basically you know, many children just, you know, will die on the waiting list if they're waiting for a size-matched organ donor. Fortunately, little children often, you know, aren't involved in terrible accidents. I mean, they are, but, uh, you know, the chances of, of getting a live size-matched liver donor is small. And it really wasn't until bismuth and others uh, began to understand the segmental anatomy of the liver that suddenly they can do a left lateral segmentectomy and transplant that segment to the liver uh, from an adult into a child, you know, allowing us to kind of basically mitigate this prolonged waiting time and really resulted uh, not only in saving patients' lives, but really also evolved, you know, the whole pathway of living-related uh, liver transplantation. I think we're better at selecting recipients and donors. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than uh, transplanting a very large liver into a very small child. Uh, those children don't do well. Uh, we used to be a little bit more cavalier, but now with technical variant grafts, we can really tailor the donor liver to the child much better. Uh, so really now the one-year graft survival rates are about 90 percent, but it really requires a tremendous uh, team effort. And, you know, for all the surgical residents here, I'm very grateful, you know, for all the great work that you all do in the care of these patients uh, because it is a 24-7 job. So... Um, Again, it's, it's exceedingly important to assure uh, when you get referred to a patient that the liver disorder that the child has is irreversible, that there's no alternate therapies for these patients. Um, acute liver failure really needs to be uh, embarked upon in an aggressive manner because these children can die uh, within 72 hours and they aren't adequately cared for. Uh, one has to define the type of metabolic disorder it is. Is it a urea cycle defect? Is it primary oxalosis? Uh, is it tyrosinemia? What is that disorder? Uh, just like Catherine, who had cystic fibrosis, is there a systemic disease that's causing the liver disorder? Is there a systemic disease that, despite doing the liver transplant, will still cause the demise of the child downstream? And then also, uh, we still see patients uh, with hepatoblastoma and hepatocellular carcinoma that are unresectable and ultimately require a liver transplant for long-term survival. I think the most important message I have for individuals taking care of for children uh, with liver failure is to make, you know, prompt referrals to the transplant center, uh, especially in patients with fulminant liver disease. Uh, often we will get these patients maybe seven or eight days into their fulminant liver failure. Uh, that is essentially an eight-day deficit in being put on the waiting list, and it's still extremely painful uh, to see a baby die from fulminant liver failure because you just did not have enough time to find an adequate donor. Uh, so patients with progressive hepatic insufficiency 
patients with cholestasis despite a Kasai procedure, those with pulmonary liver failure ought to have a prompt referral to a transplant center so that we can assess whether these children need to be on the waiting list or not. So livers are essentially, uh, again, I think an advancement in um, liver transplantation, both in children and adults, is really kind of the allocation system that exists now. Uh, so children are basically uh, put on the waiting list as it relates to their Pell score. A Pell score is actually a formula that we utilize that basically assesses a three-month waiting list mortality. Uh, it's linked to age, albumin, bilirubin, INR, and growth curve. And also, uh, in certain cases, let's say, for example, if you have a hepatoblastoma, um, you know, those patients are going to have a normal bilirubin, normal INR, essentially a normal growth curve, so they would never get transplanted if it was just associated with the Bell score. Fortunately, we're able to ask for exception points and get those kids high on the list, uh, likewise with patients with metabolic disorders. So um, this is just a curve of the mortality of children uh, related to their Pell score, and I think the message here is that once a child gets to a Pell score of about 15, uh, those patients really ought to be active on the waiting list uh, because once you get beyond 15, there's a progressive increase in their mortality. And again, prompt referral to transplant center allows us to, to get ahead of this curve. When you take a look at the waiting list of all patients uh, <clears throat> on the waiting list, uh, only about 10 to 15 percent of patients on the national waiting list are infants and children. And when you actually break that down into the type of organs that these children are waiting for, especially those who are less than five years of age, a little bit, about 50 percent of these patients are individuals waiting for a liver to save their lives. There are still children who die on the waiting list. Um, you know, overall, about uh, eight to 10 uh, patients die uh, per 100 waiting list years. Uh, unfortunately, that, that is a little higher uh, for children who are less uh, than six years of age. And when you take a look at liver recipient ages, again, about 10 to 15 percent of patients transplanted in this country are children who are less than five years of age. So in a busy transplant center such as ours, uh, let's say we do about 80 uh, liver transplants a year, about eight to 10 of those patients are gonna be children. And that's exactly where we're marking right now. So this past year, we've done seven uh, pediatric liver transplants, and we're probably gonna do about 75 adult, you know, 75 livers this year. So um, in, 19, in the early 1990s, uh, we began to start doing uh, living-related liver transplants uh, for children and a little bit later on for adults. Uh, but what this graph shows is that for kidneys, uh, in the early 1990s, only 50% of kidneys were predominantly living-related. Um, and as you moved into the mid-1990s and now in, in this decade, nearly half and half, you know, there's an equal amount of living-related kidney transplants as there are cadaveric. And that's really because of the onset of laparoscopic uh, nephrectomies. And so donors are now much more willing to do, to donate kidneys. When it comes to uh, living-related liver transplants, it's still a very small percent of all patients we transplant. Probably 5% of all liver transplants we do are living-related. We have an active living-related liver transplant program here, uh, usually focused on patients who have low male scores or low Pell scores. Fortunately, with te technical variant allografts, we don't have to really utilize living-related liver transplants for children as much as we do for adults. Uh, we often can get a reasonable donor for a child if we're able to actually put those patients on the list. So we haven't, when I was here before I became president, we did maybe three or four living-related liver transplants on kids. Uh, we haven't had to do that uh, in the past year. So survival by age, um, those children who are less than one year of age, maybe in the six to eight month uh, 
kind of age frame, have about an 80 to 90 percent one-year survival. Um, again, it, it's really about being able to optimize their pre-transplant state uh, and try to get these kids to be about 10 kilograms before you transplant because less than 10 kilograms, you know, these vessels are really small to the astomos. And, um, and then less than 10 kilos, uh, to get a, even a technical variant allograft, they're usually just too large to put in these little babies and you develop compartment syndromes and so forth. And so, again, it's really trying to find the optimal time to transmit these children. <coughs> so again, we've already spoken about this. I think other things about the preoperative assessment, it's important to assess uh, the cardiac status of these children to make sure they don't have pulmonary hypertension, which often happens uh, with progressive cirrhosis. <laughs> Uh, with little children, you really have to rule out thrombogenic disorders. Uh, you really have to be cognizant about their CMV and EBV uh, status. Uh, donors who have EBV and recipients who are EBV negative have a higher risk of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, you really want these children to have all their vaccinations before transplant because live attenuated vaccines are contraindicated uh, in the first year after transplant. And you really have to understand the family unit when I first started liver transplants, and even when I, uh, I almost quit liver transplant surgery because you would save these children, but you would destroy a family. Uh, many of these parents would end up getting divorces because either mother or dad would be totally focused on the child, ignore everything else, and ultimately would lead uh, really to uh, a family breakdown. And then when mother and dad get divorced and the family unit becomes dysfunctional, then these children don't take their immune suppressants and they end up getting rejection. So um, at least when I came over here, I ended up really devoting a lot of time to, to the parental support aspects of, of this disease. Uh, the parents need a lot of help being able to get through, you know, such a significant disease process in their children. When these children come in, uh, especially biliary atresia patients, uh, malnutrition is the norm. Uh, so it's really inherent upon the pediatricians and those taking care of the patients prior to transplant that you have significant attention to the nutrition of the child. All these children have malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins. They, in essence, all have growth retardation. And the better nourished a child is before transplant, uh, the more of a buffer you have post-transplant. So there are contraindications to liver transplant, of course, systemic sepsis. Uh, HIV is a relative contraindication. We don't do transplants here on HIV-infected uh, patients, but other centers do. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, patients don't have irreversible neurologic disease. Uh, so a variety of issues that we want to make sure that we actually try to assess preoperatively before proceeding uh, with a liver transplant because we want to make sure that we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, which is save the baby's life, but also make sure that they have a quality of life that is worth living uh, and, and that can really assure themselves, uh, you know, a long survival. So again, uh, with our patients who are malnourished, we try to improve bowel flow through uh, utilizing uh, Actigal or ursodeoxycholic acid, really optimize their middle chain triglycerides, optimize their vitamin supplementations, and try to kind of control their terrible pruritus. So uh, you would expect that uh, in this day and age, you would not see a child like this. Uh, this is a child with biliary atresia who uh, basically uh, lost the window for the opportunity for transplant. This is a child uh, that was referred to us actually by video conference uh, about three months ago uh, from Latin America. And unfortunately, this child just you know, is at a point that is just too malnourished, uh, has terrible portal hypertension, uh, and it would just never survive a liver transplant. So we unfortunately, you know, we had to just basically tell this family that, um, you know, this, this child just would not survive. So unfortunately, sometimes you got to give bad news and just say, you know, we could do the operation, but the survival is going to be, you know, just terrible. Now, in contrast, uh, this is a child again with biliary atresia, but a child who's been well cared for preoperatively. So this child, um, their, their pediatric gastroenterologist was extremely attentive to nutrition, uh, basically very early on given supplemental enteral feeds, and as you can see is well-nourished, 
And this is about two months before her uh, liver transplant. And, um, you know, has fortunately done exceedingly well. So uh, biliartresia is, uh, again, the most common disorder uh, that we see uh, as pediatric transplant surgeons. Uh, it is a destructive inflammatory process that affects various lengths of the biliary tract. Uh, this results in progressive fibrosis of the biliary tree, uh, resulting in cholestasis, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, ascites, et cetera. About uh, one to 10,000, maybe a little bit more live births are affected. Uh, females are affected more than males. Uh, often there's no family history of, of biliary disorders or biliary atresia. And there is a higher incidence, at least in Asians in the African-American population. Uh, most of these uh, patients uh, are born perfectly normal. And uh, it really is, behooves the neonatologist and the pediatrician uh, to really have a high index of suspicion in any child who has hyperbilirubinemia and of a direct component. Um, people still don't know the cause of biliary atresia. It could be related to a rotavirus, um, but, it, but you know, there also is a prenatal form uh, where patients may have situs inverses and have uh, multiple uh, spleens, and sometimes that's associated with these. Uh, as well as portal vein hypoplasia. Uh, but in large part, these babies are born entirely normal. So the window to diagnose these babies should really be in the first six weeks of life. So if you have a jaundice child in the NICU and is a direct hyperbilirubinemia, if that child still has a direct hyperbilirubinemia in the first four weeks of life, it ought to start raising some red flags. Um, in fact, even this year, uh, one of the children that we transplanted had a delayed diagnosis of biliary atresia and actually, um, you know, could not even undergo a PSI because it was diagnosed at four months of life. <laughs> so if you have a direct hyperbilirubinemia, uh, we're not a rule out uh, anatomic reasons like colodocal cysts, uh, get a HIDA scan. If there's no excretion in the uh, GI tract, uh, you better be thinking about doing a percutaneous liver biopsy. And even if that is not diagnostic, then uh, even being conservative would be to do an intraoperative cholangiogram. Because if we don't actually do a CASI procedure on patients with biliary atresia by about eight weeks of life, the chances of actually being able to cure these patients of their cholestasis just becomes increasingly small. So uh, this is a percutaneous liver biopsy done on one of our patients. A busy slide, but really what this slide shows is bile duct proliferation, uh, which is really diagnostic of bile duct obstruction, and really one should lead right to an intraoperative cholangiogram, and if, if again, confirms the diagnosis, uh, proceed with a CASI procedure. Uh, this is a uh, intraoperative cholangiogram. Uh, you can see, you know, just a remnant of the gallbladder light up, but you don't see any intrahepatic or extrahepatic uh, biliary tree or any uh, contrast going to the GI tract. So the next step here is to go ahead and do a CASI procedure. A CASI procedure is really a hepatic portal enterostomy. Uh, essentially, uh, you basically dissect the portal plate uh, at the level of the portal vein bifurcation. Uh, you excise the portal plate. Hopefully, you'll have you know, small ductules that one can identify, and then basically do a ruin y uh, hepatic portal enterostomy. Even though uh, we do these CASI procedures, uh, I think if you, if you do it within the first uh, six weeks of life, uh, you probably have about a 40% chance of a reasonable outcome. Uh, but after six to eight weeks of life, um, even patients undergoing a portal enterostomy, about 75% of the patients will ultimately need a liver transplant downstream. Uh, one of the benefits of a CASI, though, is, is that often if you do it, uh, even if you fall into the category that leads to liver transplant, you can get that child to be about three years of age before needing a liver transplant. And again, if you can get these children to be over 10 kilograms of, of weight, uh, then the chances of a successful transplant begin to start rising exponentially. So this is just a graph that if you do a CASI at less than eight weeks of age, uh, you can basically uh, establish bile flow in about 75 to 80 percent of these patients. Uh, but if you do the CASI after three months of life, uh, these patients are often already cirrhotic and um, will probably 
uh, not result in a good outcome, even in the first year of life. So uh, that's the first patient that we presented that was well-nourished from biliary atresia. Uh, and this is her about two months after her liver transplant. And she's just entirely normal now. Uh, so she's now living in Colorado, and um, you know, mother and family and child are doing exceedingly great. So acute liver failure, um, otherwise known as fulminant liver disease, is still um, really one of the most um, challenging uh, disease processes that we care for uh, as pediatric liver transplants. Uh, the cause of liver failure uh, for these fulminant liver disease patients in about 50% of the cases, we will never know why it happened. Uh, it's probably related to a virus uh, that basically infected the hepatocytes. The immune system became so vigorous that it not only killed the virus, but killed the hepatocyte. And so we often don't even culture either a virus or bacteria in these patients with fulminant liver failure. Uh, there are patients with metabolic disorders, such as tyrosinemia or Wilson's disease that can come in uh, with fulminant liver disease, uh, patients with autoimmune hepatitis, uh, can sometimes come in with liver with with acute liver failure, and you know Tylenol overdose, uncommon in little infants, uh, in adolescents can come in in acute fulminant liver disease. Uh, these patients often come in severely coagulopathic, uh, encephalopathic. Um, again, uh, the most common cause I think is a viral hit. Uh, these <laughs> patients need to be in the ICU right away. Uh, we need to optimize their coagulation parameters, uh, prevent fluid overload because they all de develop uh, cerebral edema. And the key here is to try to transmit these children uh, before they herniate. Uh, one of the very first referrals we got uh, as we reopened the liver transplant program here was a patient with fulminant liver failure from the valley. And unfortunately, we could not save this baby's life because the baby herniated. So uh, if you're able to transmit these children before they, they begin to develop significant encephalopathy, uh, we can get these babies uh, about a 75 to 80% one-year survival. But if they progress to stage three or four encephalopathy, uh, the chances of reversing this uh, become increasingly small. And those with cerebral edema uh, really have a poor prognosis. And um, you know, every once in a while, despite doing all the studies that we do, uh, we may end up transmitting a child who has irreversible neurologic uh, insult. That's, uh, that's not a pleasant thing to go through. So um, these are two identical twins, uh, one like Leilani, and uh, the one leaning down is Katalea. And this little child, Katalea, uh, came in with fulminant liver failure about six months ago, mm -hmm. and we were fortunate uh, to do a liver transplant on her, and uh, within three weeks she was home and now is living an entirely normal life. She was a challenging case because she was beginning to develop cerebral edema. Uh, we were basically uh, in a corner and ended up having to fly to St. Louis to get a, um, a left lateral segment. Uh, the, that left lateral segment was actually too large for her. And we ended up having to actually put a silo and basically uh, over a 10 day period compress this liver into this child. And fortunately we got away with it. It's not something I want to experience again. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a humbling experience to do this liver transplant and have this baby come out with this huge you know, silo and have it explain this to the parents. Uh, but fortunately, she did just fine. Uh, so this is uh, little Ariana. And Ariana is a baby with algal syndrome. Um, these babies have severe cholestasis. Uh, and in some cases, have such a poor quality of life uh, because their pruritus is incapacitating and they get malnourished. Uh, so algal syndrome uh, is really a positive interlobular bile duct, sometimes confused with biliary atresia. Uh, but unlike biliary atresia, these patients have a kind of a prominent uh, uh, frontal features in their cranium. Uh, if you do a, an eye exam, they'll have a posterior embryo toxin. Uh, they'll have vertebral arch defects. They can often have pulmonary artery stenosis. Uh, again, pruritus uh, is very, very common on these children. Uh, if you do a mutation uh, analysis on them, they'll often have a mutation in jagged one encoding for a notch receptor. 
Uh, patients with metabolic uh, liver disease, again, account for about uh, 10 to 12 percent of the patients that we transplant. Uh, the most common metabolic disorder that we see are patients with antitrypsin deficiency or urea cycle defects. So this past year, we were able to uh, care for a patient by the name of Cecilia. Uh, you see Ceci here. This is before her liver transplant, and she looks perfectly healthy. Uh, however, uh, she has glycogen storage type 1A disease. And uh, ever since she was born, in the first two months of life, she was having terrible seizures, uh, and she was diagnosed with disease. And so since two months of life, her diet was composed of strictly cornstarch. Um, and, and she required a G-tube, continuous cornstarch infusions. Uh, these patients develop pancreatitis. They develop hyperlipidemia. Uh, they develop renal insufficiency. And she actually was referred to us at about 15 years of age when she basically said, I'm tired of this. I want to go to college. I can't go to college like this. You know, she read up on this, and she told her physician, I want a liver transplant. So uh, she came to us uh, really looking well. Um, but in her case, uh, she basically was beginning to develop hepatic adenomas, uh, really a uh, complication of glycogen storage disease uh, that has a high incidence of developing hepatocellular carcinoma. So in her case, uh, this is an MRI that we did, and you begin to start seeing probably in segment, uh, uh, I would say maybe segment eight, uh, she has a, about a four centimeter hepatic adenoma and, and to me, this was sufficient evidence uh, to really rec strongly recommend, you know, a liver transplant, even on a child that appeared to be doing so well, because the last thing we wanted for her was to develop a pentacerta carcinoma and then lose the window for liver transplant. So she's doing exceedingly well. Um, we do see patients with hepatoblastomas uh, coming to us when they are unresectable. Uh, the most common malignancy in children is a hepatoblastoma. Uh, the median age of diagnosis is about one year of age. They often secrete alpha fetal protein. In some cases, they can secrete beta HCG, resulting in precocious puberty. Uh, the etiology of hepatoblastoma are really immature hepatic epithelium. Uh, they can be derived into epithelial, anaplastic, or macrotubricular uh, cellular types. Uh, really, the best prognosis is a fetal cell type, and the worst prognosis is a small cell undifferentiated hepatoblastoma. The staging of hepatoblastoma is predominantly by imaging, uh, and basically uh, it's called a pretext uh, imaging studies, uh, and it really depends on where the tumor is related to the hepatic veins and to the portal venous structures and how many segments of the liver it involves. So uh, pretext one uh, hepatoblastomas are often easily resectable. Uh, Likewise, with hepatic, uh, with pretext two, they predominantly involve, you know, either a segment or one lobe of the liver. Uh, once you start developing hepatoblastomas that are pretext three, which are far more central, involving uh, the portal venous system or the portal uh, triad, or involves more than, you know, is bilobar, uh, those patients should be referred to a liver transplant center, uh, even while undergoing chemotherapy, in case the chemotherapy does not shrink the tumor enough that. That, that it allows the surgeon to resect the tumor. So um, hepatoblastomas uh, that, re that are referred to us are those that are, are encroaching the hepatic veins uh, that involve the portal vein bifurcation, uh, tumors that involve all four sectors of the liver. Uh, hepatoblastomas can still proceed to liver transplantation even if a patient had a lung metastasis as long as those met metastatic tumors are removed or are resolved post-treatment. Uh, fortunately, hepatocellular carcinoma is rare in children uh, because their prognosis is really not very good, even post-transplantation. So um, in regards to the success of the treatment of patients with pediatric uh, hepatoblastomas, uh, complete surgical resection is crucial for the cure of the patient. Uh, fortunately, these are very sensitive to chemotherapy, mostly cisplatin-based chemotherapies, and 75% of all lesions are felt to be um, unresectable in the beginning, can become resectable with chemotherapy. It's really those patients with pretext three or four tumors uh, that if they don't adequately respond to chemotherapy will proceed to transplantation. About 80 to 85 percent of these patients will survive uh, either surgical resection with chemotherapy 
and the same is true uh, after liver transplantation if you're able to actually resect these patients or, or transplant these patients in time. So uh, I spoke to you about technical graft variants. Uh, so uh, we now have the opportunity to do a size matched uh, liver transplant, which is a whole organ, a reduced size allograft, a living related liver transplant, or a split graft where we can actually transmit the right hepatic lobe into an adult and the left lateral segment into a child. So this is just an example of a whole liver allograft that we're prepared uh, to put into a recipient. Um, fortunately, uh, as a result of the great work of Dr. Bismuth and others, we really understand the segmental anatomy of the liver. Uh, so we can utilize segments two and three uh, for infants. Uh, that's the left lateral segment. And we can utilize the right hepatic lobe uh, segments five, six, seven, and eight uh, into an adult. Uh, we don't do this often anymore. We used to split these livers on the back table uh, and often would only utilize the left lateral segment for the child and discard the right hepatic lobe. There is no need to do this anymore. Uh, we can essentially save two patients' lives uh, utilizing the left lateral segment for an infant and the right hepatic lobe for an adult. And so often now we will do these splits in a heart beating brain dead donor and basically have both teams there at the same time such that the pediatric team will basically implant the liver allograft immediately after its harvest, and the adult team will do the same uh, for the right hepatic lobe. Uh, this is really just an example of splitting a liver uh, in a heart-beating brain-dead donor, and uh, it, it really is a beautiful, actually, operation uh, to be able to actually split these livers, preserving the blood supply, and allowing both grafts to save uh, two patients' lives. Uh, this is really the genesis of you know, developing the operation for living-related uh, liver transplants. Uh, this is basically uh, a, a split uh, that we did in a living donor uh, where uh, this donor donated her left lateral segment uh, to her son. And um, both patients did exceedingly well. Uh, and this is just a picture of what a left lateral segment looks like uh, once you implant it uh, into a child. I, th I would say that this left lateral segment was a bit too large for this child. Uh, but anyhow, we have to sometimes tater uh, these variants, uh, allografts with children. So uh, postoperatively, um, it's essentially advanced ICU management. Uh, really kind of the messages that I tell our, our residents is to try to keep the hemodynamics as stable as possible, make sure we don't volume overload these patients because that translates to high CVP and a congested liver, uh, trying to optimize uh, coagulation parameters, making sure they don't get too coagulopathic. Uh, but really, for me, the, the best advance has been, you know, essentially advanced uh, duplex ultrasound imaging, uh, where we can really assess in real time what the portal vein is looking like, uh, what the hepatic artery is looking like, as well as the hepatic veins. And so we are very aggressive in doing daily ultrasounds on these babies for the first 10 days post-transplant uh, because, you know, hepatic artery thrombosis occurs in about 15 to 20 percent of these patients. Uh, you can develop portal vein thrombosis in about 10 percent. Uh, and we still, every once in a while, have hepatic venous outflow obstructions that can really also, uh, you know, be devastating for the allograft. And so we're very fortunate. We've got very dedicated ultrasound technologists here that are uh, really help us every day with these babies. Here's just an example of a hepatic artery uh, waveform that uh, basically is suggestive of a tardive parvus waveform, uh, and this is highly suggestive of hepatic artery stenosis. And uh, in this case, one, either one ought to consider either taking this baby back uh, to explore the hepatic artery or doing an arteriogram. So uh, immune suppression that we utilize today, uh, basically for children, uh, we use Prograf and we use Solumedrol. After the first three months of life, uh, both transplant, uh, these babies are essentially just on Prograf. So Prograf basically is a calcineurin inhibitor uh, that basically uh, prevents uh, the uh, dephosphorylation of a transcription factor uh, that results in the production of interleukin-2. So we really basically block that mechanism very similar to cyclosporin, uh, and that is really our leading 
uh, immune suppressant for children. It used to be these children were on massive amounts of steroids by three months post-transplant. These children are just on program, and you would never know that they had a liver transplant. Uh, for adults, we also use Celsep, uh, which basically uh, inhibits ino inositol monophosphate dehydrogenase, uh, which involves purine syntheses. So uh, Celsep involves both B and T cells. Uh, cycl <coughs> cyclosporin in program is predominantly T cells. Uh, and now we have rapamycin uh, that's also blocks interleukin-2 uh, production, but that goes through a different mechanism uh, through the mechanism of target of rapamycin receptors. Uh, we still have to be very vigilant about post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, basically, there's an imbalance between helper and uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, one can develop a monoclonal proliferation of B lymphocytes that is very similar to lymphoma, and these patients really basically uh, require a reduction in their immune suppression if they develop PTLD. About 10 percent of patients uh, will develop PTLD uh, post-transplant. Um, it is often related to patients who receive an EBV positive donor into an EBV negative donor. Clinical presentations are very kind of like mononucleosis. Uh, you can develop lymphadenopathy. And if you diagnose this in time, uh, really, you can really have a very good outcome by just reducing immune suppression. Uh, sometimes you have to give rituximab and other forms of chemotherapy, but we can usually get these children through a post-transplant lymphoproliferative state. So um, these are two children that years ago I transplanted when they were about three years of age. Uh, these children at three years of age had a urea cycle disorder and uh, both got transplanted. And this was last year when they came up to see me and just to thank me for doing their liver transplant. So it really is very satisfying to transplant these children at a very young age and then see them as young adults or, in fact, as college students saying thank you. So uh, again, my hat off to Tom Starzl, my hat off to Jean Burrell, and my hat off to all of you for giving me the privilege of doing these type of procedures here at UT Health Science Center. Thank you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.